So I'm continuing on in the series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as I've said before, I believe they are for us today and that we should be seeking the Holy Spirit to give us these gifts and have them manifesting and operating in our own lives. But not for our own fame or recognition, but for Yahweh's glory and for his kingdom. That when these gifts are manifested in the body of Messiah, it is for the edification, exhortation and building up of the saints, the believers. I've already covered the gift of wisdom and also the gift of knowledge. So if you haven't done so, I encourage you to go back and look at those teachings. As it is my opinion that these are severely lacking within the body, the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge. And we need them, especially moving forward in the days and hour that we live in. So today, I'm going to be talking about the gift of faith, which I also believe is severely lacking among the body. So we see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 9 in the, in the passage of, that talks about all the different gifts. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, to another faith by the same Spirit and to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit. So we're just going to be focusing on this gift of faith. So first off, we see in this verse that it is a gift. It is something that is given by the Holy Spirit. It is also my own opinion and belief that the gifts can be found throughout the Old Testament. They're not just new. And I think we would all agree that faith is found and manifested all through the Old Testament. I don't think there would be much argument there. But this faith is an extraordinary faith. When we're talking about the gift of faith, it is an extraordinary faith. It is a supernatural faith. A faith that is given to us by God. This faith is connected once again to having a relationship to God and by being obedient to his ways and his word. In this verse we see it as a gift given by the Holy Spirit. There are many verses that talk about faith in the Bible. I want to go back to the Hebrew perspective of faith. As in our modern day world, I believe we have mostly a Greek view of faith and what it means. I want to try and bring about more clarity of this word faith and a more concrete view of what faith is and what this gift is for us today. In Ephesians 2.8, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So we see here that faith is a gift again. In this verse we see that we are saved through faith and that it is a gift. Another popular verse that many of us would recognise to do with faith, and there's many verses in our Bible that we can connect faith with, is this one is in Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, and it says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. So we've heard this said many, many times, the just shall live by faith. Especially when we're talking on the subject of faith. We all exercise faith every day. When you turn on the tap at home, do you expect water to come out? Or when you drive your car, that the engine will start? And that the wheels will stay on and won't fall off? <laughs> you all came here today and sat in a chair. Not really thinking twice if it would support you or not. No one here, I observe, no one here today picked up their chair and looked at all the screws and bolts and nuts underneath to see whether they were going to hold you. You just expected that that seat was going to support you and hold you up and that it wouldn't collapse. 
See, all these things, these are that experiential knowledge, experience. You've done these things your whole life. So you just know that they're going to happen most of the time. But the faith I'm talking about today, this is a gift from God. It's different from everyday life. More on that a bit later. Now the Greek word predominantly for faith is pistis. And it means conviction of the truth of anything. Belief, faith, fidelity and faithfulness. Now, the conviction of the truth of anything. Say, so somebody can have a faith in anything. They, they can have a conviction in anything, whether we think that's right or wrong. It's their conviction of anything. Now, we're talking about Greek culture. Now, faith is an English word. The problem with an English word faith is that it is an abstract word, meaning that it means different things to different people. If I ask 20 different people about what they think faith is, I would more than likely get many different answers. In our modern 21st century world, faith is not only directly associated with God, but people also have faith in many ways and views, especially in our modern world. People have faith in the universe. People have faith in themselves and in their own skills and abilities. People have faith in other people. And they also have faith in different philosophies and methods. So faith is this real broad word, especially in our day and hour, whereas maybe a generation or two ago, mostly, people mostly associated faith with, with God. The Greek pistis, was used in Greek culture and then was brought into a religious setting. So that was used within the Greek culture first and then it was introduced and brought in. The idea in Greek culture was predominantly a trust, confidence or trustworthiness in another person. It was along the concept of being trustworthy and faithful in fulfilling an agreement or a contract. That's what this word pistis was used for in the Greek culture. Not necessarily anything to do with God. It was brought in because that's the closest idea they had to trying to give the meaning of faith. And this was also associated with a confidence in the different gods that they served and worshipped as well. The Greek pistis is a word they use to try and convey a Hebrew word and a Hebrew concept because that's the only thing they had in their, in their vocabulary. But in my view, it misses the meaning of Hebrew, especially when it comes to God. It was not used for that reason in the Greek originally. It was used between relationships between people. Just because you can translate a word from one language to another doesn't mean you convey the meaning of that word as well, which we find many times, especially from Hebrew to Greek. This really surprised me. <laughs> the word faith in the New King James is found twice in the Old Testament, 28 times in the ESV, nine times in the NIV, and three times in the NAS the word faith, the English word. This is a good example of what happens when you only rely on an English word in your understanding. It is like the words Holy Spirit. If one relies on those English words alone, they will see that they are found not much in the Old Testament. So therefore doctrines of men are made up and belief systems come about concluding that the Holy Spirit didn't do much in the Old Testament or wasn't around much or involved much within the people. That the Holy Spirit is a New Testament thing to do with the day of Pentecost and the, the apostles. So the Holy Spirit is predominantly New Testament, 
So therefore, we don't need that New Te- Old Testament stuff anymore. That it's related to Jesus and the apostles. Therefore, the gifts are New Testament ideas simply because we don't read the words Holy Spirit much in the Old Testament. Whereas if you go to the Hebrew word for spirit, it is absolutely everywhere through the Old Testament. The English translation mainly has the Greek translation influence on it. That's just the fact. Most of our modern English translations are influenced by the Greek text, not so much the Hebrew. But what I teach and show is that I believe it is imperative to go back to the Hebrew language and Hebrew culture to get a more accurate understanding on what the scriptures mean. So we're going to do that with this word faith. We're going to go all the way back to Hebrew and to what it originally meant. A few few Hebrew words are used for the English word faith and the Greek word pistis, but they have the same root. So we're going to have a look at some of these Hebrew words now. One of the Hebrew words is imuna. Some of us may be familiar with this term, imuna, and it means firmness, steadfastness, fidelity, faithfulness, and trust is this Hebrew word imuna. Now, just for a, just to contrast it with the word faith and how often it was used in the Old Testament in those different translations, this word imuna is used 49 times in the Old Testament. So it's far greater than the English word faith. And we see this word used in the Habakkuk 2.4, which we read out earlier, Behold and proud his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his emuna, his faith. That's what this word is in this particular verse, emuna. Now let's have a look at this same verse in a couple of different translations and we'll get a better idea. Look at this in the uh, complete Jewish Bible. It says, look at the proud. He is inwardly not upright, but the righteousness will attain life through trusting faithfulness. And again, in the Young's literal translation, the same verse, lo, a presumptuous one not upright in his soul within him, and the righteousness by his steadfastness liveth. So here we just see uh, uh, the way it's, it's brought across differently in a few different translations. Because they're using, they're trying to convey this Hebrew idea of a muna. And we've come up with st- steadfastness and faithfulness and faith. Different English words trying to convey this idea of Amuna. Another Hebrew word that is used is Amun. And it means trusting and faithfulness. Now this word is very similar to the last word, Amuna, and this word is found 29 times in the Old Testament. So again, a lot more than English translations. And we see this word used in Deuteronomy 32.20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children whom is in no faith. Immune, in this particular instance. Now again, I want to show this same verse in a couple of different translations. The complete Jewish Bible says this. He said, I will hide my face from them and see what will become of them. They are a perverse generation, untrustworthy children. A bit different to having no faith. Untrustworthy children. Is and it's it still the same word? Yeah. It's the same word, a moon. The young's literal. In Deuteronomy 32, 20, and he saith, I hide my face from them. I see what is their latter end, for a froward generation are they, sons in whom is no steadfastness. So again, we see different ideas to faith. 
Now, the last Hebrew word I want to show you for faith is aman. This is where we get the word amen from, which is actually a Hebrew word, amen. And it means to support, confirm, be faithful, to believe, to nourish, establish, reliable and faithful. Now, these three Hebrew words that I've just shown you, they all have the same root which is an Aleph, a Mem, and a Noon. Now, this word Aman, Aleph, Mem, Noon, this root is also used for the nursing of a child. Why? Because the child exhibits all these characteristics that this word means from its mother. It, 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 it has the support of the mother. The mother nourishes the child, as only a mother can do. The child sees the mother as reliable and faithful in a normal situation. This word aman is used 125 times in the Old Testament, and it's directly related to faith in one way or the other. The Hebrew concept of faith, not the English. So already we see, just going through these different Hebrew words, how much more extensively they're used in the original language than just the English word faith. And this word aman is, we can be found in Genesis 15, 6, and it says, And he believed in Yahweh, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It's the word believed. Aman. So now we are just starting to see a little difference between Greek and Hebrew. One of the big differences between the Greek mindset and the Hebrew mindset is as follows. Faith in Greek is tied to having a belief in something or someone, but it's mainly to do with the mind and the intellect. For example, if someone asks you, do you have a faith? Now, as I've said before, today that can mean many different things. But it is used to mean you have a belief in God. It was more of a question of the intellect and the mind. Or if someone asks you, what faith are you? Meaning, what doctrines do you adhere to? Or what church do you attend? Or what religion do you follow? That's what they're asking. That's what they're seeking the answer to. But they're connecting that to faith. Again, it's to do with the mind or a philosophy or a doctrine. Anyone can say they believe in God. In the Hebrew, it is more to do with how one lives. It is one's actions. The old saying that we have, actions speak louder than words. It is also living in a certain state or lifestyle in the Hebrew mindset. It is similar, it is a similar idea to the Holy Spirit, which in Hebrew can mean breath or wind. Now one cannot see the wind, but one can see the evidence of the wind. So it is with faith. It is not intellectual. It's not I believe or I have faith. In Hebrew, one can see the evidence of faith by how one lives or how one behaves. It is the evidence of Faith in Hebrew is connected to evidence. Another aspect to faith is I want to show you in the Hebrew mindset. It is found in Exodus 17, 12. And it says, But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. 
and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, there is a beautiful pattern revealed in this verse. And I want to show it to you. They took a stone and put it under Moses. The Hebrew word for stone is Evan, spelt with an aleph, a bet, and a noon. In the Hebrew, this can mean the father and the son, which means rock. So they put the Evan under him, and he sat on it. The word steady in this verse is the word imuna, where they lifted up Moses' hand and supported and caused him to be steady. So they, they supported him, they lifted his hands up, one on one side, one on the other. They supported him and caused him to be steady. One could also see a picture of the crucifixion. Especially with one of the functions of a nail is to support and to hold steady. That's what the function of a nail is. Hebrew is a very function oriented language. A concrete picture of faith you can see on your screens is a tent peg that is driven into solid ground. This is a concrete picture of what faith means in Hebrew. Is that tent peg being dri driven into, into solid ground which has the purpose of causing the tent to be firm, steady and steadfast. It causes stability, it supports. This firmness, steadfastness and support are the evidence of a belief. One that is not easily moved, they have a conviction about their faith, lifestyle, which is revealed by how they live and follow God by doing what he says. This is the evidence. This is how Hebrews see your faith. It's not, I believe. It's not a mindset. It's not something in the mind. It's something that's shown by how one lives and behaves. Matthew 7.20 Yeshua says, Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. We've heard this so many times. What is fruit? Fruit provides evidence as to what the tree is. Now at home, we have several citrus trees growing at this time of year. And they've got fruit on them, oranges, mandarins and lemons. By looking at the tree and the fruit, I know what the type of tree it is. The lemons show the evidence of the tree. <laughs> I can say that's a lemon tree because it's got lemon fruit on it. The fruit provides the evidence as to what the tree is. At times in the Bible, people are referred to as trees. Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Fruit is another way of saying behaviour or lifestyles. And I encourage everyone that's listening to this, read the rest of this chapter before and after it to get the context. It talks about being lawless and having lawlessness and building on a rock or building on a sand. That's the context. And context is very, very important. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the faith chapter. Some call it the hall of faith with all the great men and women of faith that went before us and gives many examples of this evidence-based lifestyle that Abraham showed, that, that Gideon showed, that, that all the greats of old showed, Moses, David. It's an evidence-based faith, an evidence-based lifestyle. These are all recorded here for our examples on what faith is and on how to live. Like when Yahweh spoke to Abraham and he believed, Aman, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness which we read out in Genesis 15, 6. This belief was not intellectual. 
I believe it was Abraham taking action and doing what God said, beginning with Abram at the time. His name was Abram. When God first talked to him, Abram, get up and go to the land I will show you. But what did Abram do? He got up and went. He acted upon what he heard. Abraham took action. And we see this all through Abraham's life. Another example is when God said to him, Abraham, come up with here with your son and offer up a sacrifice. And we see this whole faith play out. Abraham again took action and took Isaac up. And he was actually going to go through with it with action. And the evidence was revealed through his actions. There is evidence all the way through to whom Abraham worshipped and followed. As with all the others that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Famous verse that we all heard, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things unseen. Faith is moving and behaving without seeing it. It's totally opposite to what we have in our culture. What's one of the famous sayings in our westernized culture? I'll believe it if I see it. Well, faith requires you to believe without seeing it. What did Yeshua say? Blessed are those who have believed without seeing. Faith. Again. It is the evidence of things unseen. Moses, uh, Abraham took off from the land of his father to a place that was unseen. He didn't Google it. He didn't look it up on Google Maps to see what it was like. He just went. Other versions use confidence and assurance where we see the substance in this verse. Other versions use confidence and assurance for things hopeful. It is being steady, steadfast, immovable, the things hope in the things hoped for, which is Yahweh's promises of protection, provision, blessing, prosperity, eternal life. These are the things that we hope for. We see this in the example of Noah. He actively built an ark in the face of ridicule and a lawless world. He didn't know what a flood looked like. How many, how many decades did it take for Noah to build this ark? He had substance in the things hoped for. He had evidence in the things that he had not yet seen. Decades it took. The gift of faith that is given to us by Yahweh is a supernatural faith. It is an extraordinary faith that surpasses human logic and experience. A faith that holds us, a faith that holds up in the most dire of situations. It holds up when the odds are stacked against you. A faith that says, if my God is for me, then who can be against me? A faith that throws me into the furnace or feeds me to the lions. Like those of the first and second century persecutions who died for their, for their faith. Just like the apostles did. This is the evidence. They just didn't simply say, oh, I believe in God. They backed it up with a lifestyle and a conviction that they were prepared to go to the burning stakes for. That they were prepared to be fed to the lions for. It is a faith that through doing actions moves and changes things. It is not a passive confession of the mouth but is an active doing of what Yahweh says to do. It always has been and always will be. It's not saying something with your mouth. 
Many times, this gift of faith is given to an individual in order to stir up the faith of others around them, especially in times of fear and crisis. And we see this with great leaders that lead armies into battles that have great odds against them. We saw this with Gideon. God windled his army down to pretty much nothing in the eyes of his opponents. And then we know the story where they're on the mountain and I think it's Elisha or Elijah, one of the two, and he had his offsider with him and there's so many of them. And he prayed that God would open up his eyes and they saw on the mountains and the ridges the myriads of angels that were with them. That's faith. Supernatural faith. We see this picture of faith in the death of Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua knew his purpose and why he came. He knew that he was to be resurrected from the dead. The crucifixion reveals this picture of faith. The nails that firmly secured and supported him on that cross revealed the faith that held him there steady and firm, which is what the meaning of faith is. It reveals this faith. Talk about a supernatural faith that we see by the evidence of what Yeshua went through. It was more than just, I believe, my father. This revealed faith. He went fully knowing he was going to rise from the dead, the things unseen. He went fully knowing that what the outcome was. This was the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. James 2, 18 to 20. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Again, evidence. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want, uh, but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now, faith and works go hand in hand. The works is the evidence of a belief or faith. Works in the New Testament is the Torah. It is the prophets and it is the writings, which are the books like Psalms and Proverbs. They are the lifestyle that God instructs to live, instructs us to live by from Genesis 1 right through to the end of Revelation. When James, or more accurately, Jacob says this in the New Testament was not written yet. So the works have to be understood in light of the Old Testament. The works are following Yahweh and his ways from the front of the book because the back of the book wasn't written yet. Romans 10.17 So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've heard this verse said and proclaimed many times. Now many think that this many think that the hearing of this verse is the hearing of the word of God. While this is true, it is so much more than just hearing with your ears. It is hearing and doing, which in what Hebrew is is what we call Shema. Hear and do. Which in when you hear and do something. In Hebrew, it reveals that you understand what you're hearing when you actually do what you're hearing. Meaning you have heard and comprehended what you heard because you go then and do it and put it into action, which is evidence. Consider this verse, and we're nearly finished, in James 1, to 24. But be doers of the word, 
and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So here again we see to be hear doers of the word. To be hearers, not only hearers, but doing what you hear. Faith and belief are so much more than just confessing and saying something out of your mouth. We have all seen and heard of actors, singers and politicians confess that they believe in God with their mouth. We have seen the actors and the singers go up on stage at their award ceremonies. When they win an award and some start their speech with, I would just like to thank God and then my parents. However, the songs that they sing and the films that they act in go totally against what God says. There is no evidence. They are very, they show and reveal a very different story. And Yeshua alludes to this when he says, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit, and a good fruit can't, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. So anyone can say they believe in God, show me by your fruit. Show me, give me the evidence of your faith. We see politicians say they believe in God, especially when it comes around to election time. And then when all is said and done, we see these very same people pass legislation and laws that are directly opposed to God they confess to with their mouths. You shall know them by their fruit. This is a big difference to saying and then actually doing something. This is evidence-based faith in the Hebrew mindset. By doing it and not hearing and saying it. So to sum it up, the gift of faith. This is a gift that can only be given to us by the Holy Spirit as He wills. It is a supernatural firmness, steadfastness, an attitude of, I don't care what the odds are or what the circumstance looks like. I am standing firm and immovable like that tent peg. For Yahweh and his ways, even if it looks like I might die. Like Daniel. He was thrown, his, and his mates were thrown into the furnace. Daniel was put before the, into, into the lion's den. They were standing for Yahweh and his ways. Like the first century believers and the, the first century apostles did. Even Yeshua himself. It was far more than a passive confession of the mouth saying, I believe. It is shown by evidence through how you live. A far cry from what church or religion one belongs to. This has nothing to do with a church denomination or the doctrines of men. It is solely on what Yahweh says and instructs on how to live and how to follow Him. I believe we are going to need this gift more and more and that we should be zealous for it, especially in the days we are coming into. If we are indeed in the end times, we really should be seeking this gift of faith. I would like to remind ourselves that this is not for the individual. It is for the edifying and encouraging and the building up of the body. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gifts of your spirit. We thank you that you equip us, that you support us, 
that you cause us to be steadfast when we can't. Father, help us to be a people that zealous seek after your gifts. Father, that we would seek them, that we would desire them, that we would see them manifest and operate among us. Father, I pray that you help us understand the way your gifts work. And Father, that we would be people that would seek them with everything in us so we can exhort one another as we see the day approaching. So that we can edify and encourage each other as we see the day draw near. What day is that? The day of the return of Yeshua, our Messiah. Which we know that before that will be great tribulation. Father, we need your gifts. Help us to be a people that seek them and to operate in them and to have confidence in them. And we thank you and we bless you and we praise you for your word. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to watch this teaching. I would like to ask you if you would hit the like button and the subscribe button. This will help us get our teachings out in front of many, many more people. And also to turn on the notification bell so that you will receive an alert for when the latest teaching comes out. I would also like to encourage you that if you are ministered to and blessed by this teaching, that you would share your thoughts and your comments in the section below. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.